Hello, I'm Chad Martin, a Renewable Energy Extension Specialist in the Agricultural and Biological Engineering Department here at Purdue University. Uh, this is a webcast that's going to be focused on the converging technologies available for converting uh, biomass materials such as switchgrass to uh, a usable biofuel. And uh, this is part of the SENUSA project, which is a NEFA sponsored pro program that uh, Iowa State is a lead organization with, along with us at Purdue University and a total of eight other institutions throughout the country, including the USDA Ag Research Service. So with me is Dr. Nate Mosier from the Department of Ag and Bioengineering, and he is going to introduce himself and, and also kind of the work that he has done um, over the several years here with the Lori Lab and other groups here at Purdue and others. But to, f to start out with, Nate, perhaps you can give us sort of the lay of the land of how we have come to this point for second generation biofuel uh, conversion technologies. What has been the past uh, since the RFS uh, came out and, and where, where we are today? So. Well, thank you, Chad. Uh, and I'll start with a little bit of an introduction and then I'll, I'll launch into your questions. Sounds so as, as you said, uh, I'm Nate Mosier. Uh, I'm a professor in agricultural and biological engineering here at Purdue University. Uh, I'm also a member of the Laboratory of Renewable Resources Engineering here at Purdue and uh, a member of the Purdue Energy Center, uh, all focused on, on renewable energy, in particular uh, biofuels and um, in, a, in a wide variety of, of different uh, aspects. So um, a little bit on the background, um, when most people think about biofuels, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, is corn ethanol, and that's definitely a success story uh, here in the United States. Uh, corn ethanol is a, a large and thriving business. Uh, there are uh, biorefineries that process corn into fuel ethanol and DDGs uh, all across the Midwest. Uh, in addition, uh, there are technologies that uh, will convert uh, sugar from sugar beets and from uh, sugar cane into biofuels, and Brazil really is kind of the, the world leader in that. Uh, and between Brazil and the United States, uh, we pretty much dominate global production of, of that particular biofuel. Uh, in addition, uh, people might think of biodiesel as another alternative biofuel. Uh, biodiesel is primarily produced from vegetable oils and soybean oil is definitely the, the real driver there, uh, particularly in the United States, uh, although there are, there are some smaller uh, biodiesel productions from other uh, oil seeds uh, around the world as well. Together, biodiesel and uh, corn ethanol or sugar ethanol uh, really uh, make up what, what most people think of as first generation biofuels. And these are biofuels that um, have been around for a long time and have been in commercial production in a really big way since really the 1990s, uh, but uh, maybe really made a, a national and international mark in the early 2000s and in the last 17 years has, has really sort of driven uh, global markets and, and renewable biofuels. That said, uh, there are technologies, and, and SINUSA has been part of uh, some of the research efforts around developing second generation biofuels. Uh, generally, second generation biofuels uh, are, are biofuels that are made from an alternative agricultural or forestry feedstock. Um, most second generation biofuels are similar to the end consumer, fuel ethanol or biodiesel like products. Uh, it's just the, the source and the feedstock is different. Um, in the United States, a lot of effort's been focused on switchgrass, and that's definitely been a focus in SEN USA as an alternative crop for producing biofuel. Uh, but other feedstocks that have been uh, looked at and have been developed include corn stover, so a byproduct of uh, regular corn grain production and the leftover stover being collected uh, in many places in the Midwest for uh, animal fodder uh, can also be used as a biofuel. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the two uh, second generation ethanol facilities that have been uh, built and are in operation today uh, in the Midwest both use corn stover as their primary feedstock, mostly due to availability because uh, anywhere the corn's grown in the Midwest, you can definitely collect the corn stover. 
for sure. And, and you know, the Send USA project is a, a model for identifying how a uh, central and uh, centrally U.S. Uh, system can be developed for these types of biomass resources and starting with uh, switchgrass but also it makes economic sense like you mentioned from a corn stover standpoint. So uh, what have been the, uh, the historical uh, research capacities that have been driving us to know how do we gain efficiencies because obviously when you have first generation biofuels the corn industry has a very sustained and very established um, um, way you know supply chain to get the the the, the feedstock to the biorefinery uh, you know second generation biofuels have been challenged from the standpoint of having just large bulky material that has to be collected and transported and, and uh, created some value too. So from that angle, you know, what are some of the opportunities that have been researched here at Purdue and maybe other places that have maybe addressed some of those challenges to getting second generation biofuel to the market? Certainly, so uh, there's a number of dimensions to what makes second generation biofuels so challenging. Uh, and you really highlighted one of those and that relates to sort of the economics and infrastructure of supply chains for supplying a biorefinery with a sufficient feedstock to make economic sense at a price they can afford. Uh, collection of, of feedstock is, is a challenge and an issue. Um, the, the conventional model for uh, corn harvesting uh, would leave the stover behind on the ground mm -hmm. and uh, the, the first uh, immediate approach people might think is a second pass through the field to collect this material on a second round through. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, of course, would add expense to the farmer, uh, fuel cost, again, for moving the equipment through the field a second time, uh, soil compaction issues and other, other issues that might um, make uh, the value proposition not as, not as strong as it could be. Uh, so that's definitely a challenge. Uh, there has been some work on alternative collection uh, strategies, um, modifications to existing um, combine harvesters that would allow uh, pull behind or simultaneous collection of the stover or at least uh, wind rowing it in a way that we can get some of that, uh, that good drying we hope to get in the fall yep. uh, before it's collected. Uh, the second issue is, is really storage. Um, storage with grain, as, as any commodity producer knows, is always an issue. Uh, and it's no different for uh, cellulosic biomass, whether we're collecting it for uh, a biorefinery or you're collecting it for uh, livestock uh, feeding. Uh, moisture is always an issue. Uh, you can have it plenty wet and, and ensile it, and that's a good way to store and, and has been a traditional way of, of storing fodder for livestock. Mm -hmm. You can have it dry in a store as well, although there are some fire risks and other risks to be mitigated in, in, in storing it. And then if you have something in between, uh, that's real, where the real danger is, uh, the, the biomass will begin to degrade compost and, and break down over time, which is uh, not good and it, it really just uh, eliminates the value uh, for the producer and for the, and the end user. Sure, sure, yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, what the efficiencies in terms of the enzymatic process for conversion versus a chemical conversion process, you know, perhaps you can expand on um, some of the, the knowledge that has been gained over the last several years. Uh, you know, I remember when George Bush mentioned the word switchgrass in his State of the Union address, and then all of a sudden we were off to the races, and there was a lot of opportunity from a research standpoint here, especially at Purdue and the Lori Lab got involved and were leaders in that area. Um, so perhaps maybe kind of walk us through that process of, you know, maybe doing some comparisons uh, and maybe how, how we can increase efficiencies in this process of conversion. Absolutely. And that, that really touches on the second real challenge uh, in, in any second generation biofuels. Uh, the first logistics, like I, I mentioned before, and we mm -hmm. talked about uh, the second is what happens in the biorefinery, really the process efficiencies. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you rightly mentioned, one of the real challenges uh, comes down to conversion of that, that cellulosic material to get the sugar out. Mm -hmm. And for making uh, ethanol, so it's sort of a, a direct replacement for corn ethanol, um, we need to make sugars that, that get fermented in much the similar way that corn starch is broken down and fermented. 
Uh, the real challenge with cellulosic materials is that it's very resistant to being broken down. Uh, as, as any farmer knows, that, that stover will stay in the field for a long time, even in the elements and the rain and, the, and all the organisms that try to, to break it down. Uh, a lot of it work has been focused over the, the last uh, 15 years since uh, George Bush mentioned switchgrass. Uh, a lot of it focused in that area of improving the enzymes, the, the catalysts that are harvested from uh, fungi, the kind of uh, mold and, and spores that uh, grow naturally on biomass out of the environment. Um, one of the real challenges from the, from the outset is because it's so hard to break down uh, even animals and, and, and organisms like fungi out in the, in the environment have a hard time breaking it down. Mm -hmm. uh, Corn starch, just to give you kind of a, a scale, uh, for every uh, ton of uh, corn that you're, you're going to process, you have less than an ounce of enzyme that is needed to break it down. Uh, for cellulosic material, where we were 15 years ago, uh, for every ton of that switchgrass or corn silver we'd break down, it was more like uh, two to four pounds of, of enzyme would be required. And th that amount of, of additional cost just made it very hard to be cost competitive. Mm -hmm. So a, lo a lot of effort's been uh, going into uh, improving the processes to make these enzymes to drive the cost of them down. Uh, but more importantly, understanding why those enzymes perform so poorly on biomass in comparison to uh, starch. Uh, some, some real progress has been made in some pre-treatment technologies, some processing that we can do to the biomass up front that makes it more favorable for being uh, converted by enzymes. Um, cost is always a, a driver there as well. Um, you're adding value, but at, at, at some cost, and so there's a, a, there's a trade-off there. Uh, in particular, uh, using as inexpensive a process as possible is, is favored. Uh, the commercial processes out there go about as low cost as you can, just water and heat. Sure. Now, do you have a graphic that kind of, you know, depicts the biomass conversion process here that you can maybe, we can kind of head to? Sure. So I, I do have a, a slide that shows uh, the two main paths that can get us from uh, cellulosic biomass to biofuels. Mm -hmm. uh, the traditional path is, is labeled biological processing. Mm -hmm. and uh, it follows this breakdown with pretreatment and enzymes and fermentation. So it's a lot, uh, a lot similar to or very much like uh, existing corn ethanol processes. Mm -hmm. And on the top, there's a, an alternative approach uh, called thermochemical processing. And there's a couple main technologies that have been developed to uh, convert biomass that way. Mm -hmm. uh, gasification, uh, which breaks down biomass into very small molecules and uh, then uses uh, catalysts, much uh, the same kind of catalysts that are found in the petrochemical industry, mm -hmm. can then take those small molecules and make a wide range of fuels. Uh, the second one's pyrolysis, yep. and pyrolysis uh, uses heat as well, but l less heat or lower temperature than pyrolysis, and you end up making a, a bio-oil out of this material uh, that can uh, then be used for biofuel after it's been further refined. So mm -hmm. uh, the upper uh, kind of process uh, resembles more like a petroleum refinery, and the bottom process is more like a, a whiskey distillery in terms of the kind of technologies, technologies that are used. Uh, there's some of the real challenges in the thermochemical process um, is like uh, Petrochemical refineries, you got to go really big before you get the economies of scale that you need. And really big means lots of biomass. And so yeah. now we're back to supply chains and, and getting sufficient materials to mm -hmm. facility. And paralysis has been a part of the San USA um, uh, research agenda uh, out of Iowa State and others. And so there's a lot of information available on the San USA website about that technology in particular. So. So where do we head from here, Nate? I mean, what's the future uh, that you can see uh, that needs to be addressed, you know, down the road as we move forward? Certainly. So one thing about second generation biofuels is, is it's sort of a half measure, right? So it's the end products are often very similar to uh, corn ethanol or, or biodiesel 
in that um, they're not direct replacements for fuels. They're, they can be blended with petroleum fuels, but they can't be used instead of petroleum fuels. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot of uh, effort looking at what are called drop-in replacements. So fuels that function exactly the same as existing fuels that can go into existing engines and existing infrastructure. Um, there's a number of technologies that are, are being looked at to, to move that forward. Uh, pyrolysis is definitely poised in that area to move closer to a, a drop-in biofuel. The kind of products made from pyrolysis are, are much more like petroleum than uh, the one product of ethanol made by the fermentation process. Um, where, where there's still some questions is uh, how to do this efficiently and at low enough cost. And, and maybe surprisingly is understanding the chemistry well enough to understand how to design a fuel that's equivalent to what's uh, in the, your fuel tank today. Um, the gasoline or the diesel that you, you put in your truck or your vehicle uh, contains tens of thousands of unique chemical compounds and we really don't quite understand uh, all the interactions of those molecules that make for a good fuel product. Uh, most of the effort in, in developing those petroleum fuels was, was trial and error. We found good approaches that gave us good results, mm -hmm. but not necessarily understand why we get what we get. So we have an opportunity to, to design a better fuel uh, if, if we have that knowledge unlocked. That's interesting and you know there's uh, certainly a lot of dynamics there associated with uh, you know, bringing in a, a new fuel to the equation from a different feedstock and, and, uh, and therein lies some of the opportunity and uh, along with the challenges. So as we wrap up this uh, particular webcast, I want to thank Nate uh, for his, his uh, knowledge and willingness to share with us today. And we also want to thank our sponsors and of course the USA group uh, and Iowa State University with all the other players and contributors. So thank you very much and uh, we'll conclude this session.